Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today, I'm happy to be chatting with Musa al Garbi. He is a sociologist and assistant professor at Stony Book, already a very well-known public intellectual, and October 8th is the publication date for his new and excellent book, We Have Never Been Woke, The Cultural Contradictions of a New Elite. I'm very happy to have blurbed it. Musa, welcome. Thank you so much for being here, it's, uh, and thank you so much for your kind words on the, on the book. <laughs> I'm sure you've been thinking about this question, but how much is the distribution of wokeness amongst the elites, as we saw maybe three or four years ago, is that something sociologically necessary, or was that extremely contingent and dependent on a whole host of factors ranging from zero interest rate policy to the rise of Trump, uh, COVID, and other matters? Are we out of that moment already? I I do think uh, so. I have I have uh, published an essay where I argued I, the Great Awakening um, does seem to be uh, winding down. Um, in the in the book, I argue um, looking at a lot of different empirical measures uh, and in some of my other published research before the book. But uh, I argue that um, it seems like starting after 2011. Um, uh, with race, gender, and sexuality and stuff, but starting a year before that with Occupy Wall Street and things like this. Um, but, but basically starting after uh, around 2010, there was this, um, significant shift among knowledge economy professionals and how we talk and think about social justice issues. Uh, but that does seem to have peaked, um, around, uh, around 2021. Looking at the measures that I was looking at in the book, it seems like a lot of those those are on the decline now. Yeah. Do we have a single coherent theory that explains both the rise of the Great Awakening and its apparent fragility? I can see that it's easy to explain either of those, but how do we do both? Yeah. Uh, so in the in the book, um, one of the things that um, I argue in the book that I think is really important for contextualizing the current moment is that uh, this current period of of rapid change. And how knowledge economy professionals talk and think about social justice and the ways we engage in politics and all of this. Um, this moment is actually a case of something. As I, as I show in the book, looking at the same kinds of empirical measurements, we can see that actually, um, there were three previous cases of, um, episodes of kind of great awakenings. Uh, uh, and, by comparing and contrasting these cases, we can get insight into questions like, why do they come about? Why do they end? Um, do they influence? Do they change anything long term, and so on? And so, to that question, um, kind of, why did they come about? Why did they end? Um, it seems like, from my, from what I what I argue in the book, is there seems to be kind of uh, two elements that are important predictors um, for when an awakening uh, might come about. Um, one of them is that they tend to happen during moments of uh, elite overproduction, when it becomes particularly acute, um, which is, uh, this is a term drawn from uh, Jack Goldsmith and Peter Turchin, for people who are, who are not already familiar with it, um, which is uh, basically when society starts producing um, more people who think that they should be elites, uh, then we have capacity to actually make give those people the lives they feel like they deserve. So uh, we have growing numbers of people who did everything right, they um, did all the extracurriculums. They got good grades in school. They graduated from college, even from the right college and, and the right majors. But they they're having a hard time, uh, you know, getting the kinds of uh, six figure jobs they expected. They can't buy a house. They're not being able to get married and live the kind of standard of living their parents had, and so on. When you have growing numbers of elites and elite aspirants that find themselves in that position, um, then what they tend to do is. Uh, grow really dissatisfied. But that problem ha hasn't gone away, right? The academic job market is still glutted. Homes cost more than they used to. And yet the great awakening is much weaker. And that gets to my point about how do we explain the contingency? Yeah. I mean, by some, by, by some of the measures, actually, uh, there, there has been an improvement. I mean, the academic job market is uh, tough and has, <laughs> um, and will probably continue to be tough for these kind of deeper structural re reasons related to, um, growing emphasis on contingent labor and, and, and so on and so forth. But, um, but it does seem like the, uh, uh, I argue in the, in the book and in some of my other, uh, public work that there, there, there do seem to be some indicators that the, the kind of the worst part of the 2010s crunch, um, <laughs> seems to, uh, seems to be, uh, fading out a little bit. And so that's, that, that's one of the things that you might expect would correlate with a great awakening, 
um, tapering. But the other thing, uh, another thing that's really um, important that, that ultimately leads these awakenings to fizzle out is that um, at the end, like, so the elite overproduction creates the motive, right? It creates the motive for a lot of these elites to condemn the prevailing order and the people who are at the top and who were successful and to try to purge some of those people and create room for themselves and, and so on. Okay, so they have a motive, um, but they don't always have the means. Um, and this is because, um, as as Seamus Khan and others have argued, uh, there's this kind of countercyclical nature of fortunes between elites and non-elites. So when when... Um, times that are uh, relatively good for elites, when the goods and services that they can acquire are, they have a lot of um, power over workers to to get goods and services at cheap uh, rates and things like this. Um, anyway, so times that are good for elites tend to be a little tougher for ordinary workers. But on the flip side, um, times that are tough for elites uh, tend to be pretty decent for a lot of other people. Um, and so it's hard for elites to get anyone to care um, if they're having a tough time in a lot of circumstances. Uh, but there are some moments when these trajectories get collapsed, when things have been kind of bad and worse for ordinary people for a while, and all of a sudden they're bad for a, a non-trivial share of elites too. Um, and then those are the moments when when the awakenings, because uh, you have a large share of the public, a large swaths of the public that is also um, frustrated and wants to see some kind of change. And, and this creates a kind of opening for these frustrated elites. But, but how does that match with the timing? So real wages for lower earners have been going up pretty well since some point from the Trump administration. Uh, equity prices are still high. It yeah. seems like pretty good for both groups. And the inflection point of when real wages started going up for a broader category of Americans, that doesn't match to either the beginning of wokeness or its recent decline. Yeah, yeah. So those are um, there are other factors at play. So I, I argue those are just two of the, the kind of um, uh, bigger predictors. Uh, one of the reasons why awakenings um, fizzle out is so um, when you have these this this moment where these two things come together, um, then uh, then that creates the conditions for the awakening to to take off. But as far as like, uh, but one problem is that as it rolls on, um, there there um, these alliances between frustrated people who want to be elites and other people, um, they tend to be kind of unstable. They're unstable in part because at the end of the day, what a lot of the uh, erstwhile elites want to do is they want to be elites. <laughs> like that's pri that's the main thing they're concerned about. They want to find a way to get themselves in the elite structure. Um, practically speaking, that's what motivates a lot of their activism. And so when some of them do manage to get folded in, they tend to disengage. Um, and, and, uh, and so that's one, one thing. And then there tend to be tensions within a lot of organizations between symbolic capitalists and, um, uh, what you might call normies, uh, because we tend to, to talk and think about a lot of social problems in ways that are very different from other people. We tend to go about politics in a different way than other people. And this alienates, um, People, um, and so you, you start seeing these kinds of internal tensions develop within social movements. And this is also one of the reasons why they just can't sustain themselves is because the, the coalition itself is kind of, uh, unstable, uh, in, in a, in a deep way. And this is one of the reasons why awakenings, um, typically don't result in revolutions is, uh, if they go on, um, beyond a certain period of time, they just, uh, they have a hard time retaining their coherence. Let me give you an alternate theory of the Great Awakening and tell me what's wrong with it. It's not really my view, but I hear it a lot. So on the left, there's some long-term investment in teaching in America's top universities. So you produce a lot of, of troops who can become journalists, and they're mostly left-leaning. And then 2011, 2012, there's something about the interaction of social media and, say, the New York Times and other major outlets where all of a sudden they have a much bigger incentive to have a lot of articles about race, gender, Black Lives Matter, whatever. And when those two things come together, wokeness takes off based on a background in Christianity and growing feminization of society. By the time you get to something like 2021, enough of mainstream media has broken down that it's simply social media out there going crazy. And that just gives us a lot of diversity of bizarre views rather than just sheer wokeness. And besides, Elon is owning Twitter. So wokeness ends. What's wrong with that account? Yeah. 
Um, so for one, I, I do think that some of the factors that you identified are um, important for contextualizing the current moment. So for instance, a lot of the symbolic professions, as you like law and consulting, academia, journalism, they are being feminized. And um, I, I, I do talk a, a bit in the book about how um, uh, this matters for understanding the dynamics in a lot of these institutions, not just over the last 10 years, but over the last, um, uh, you know, several decades, uh, in part because uh, women and men uh, tend to engage in very different forms of kind of status seeking and competition and things like that. Um, and uh, so that does matter. Um, things like social media, obviously, uh, um, do change the way interactions play out. But you can see actually that um, things like social media or trend uh, changes in the media landscape after 2010, um, one limitation for using those kinds of uh, explanations to explain the current m moment is that it becomes hard then to understand um, how or why it was the case that there were three previous episodes like this, uh, one in the 1920s through the early 30s, one in the mid-1960s through the late 70s, and then one in the late 80s through early 90s, uh, in all cases where we didn't have social media, where the media, where the structure of media enterprises was importantly different than it is today. Um, and it, before you had, you know, Gen Z kids these days with their idiosyncratic attitudes or before a lot of these professions were as feminized as they were today. So I think all of those factors you said actually do matter. And they're actually, they, they actually, they matter in the sense, um, because each of these episodes, you know, they, there's so much in common, like an insane amount. And when you read the book and, and I walk through some of these, like, I think a lot of readers will be troubled maybe by how similar these episodes are, but they're also importantly different. Um, they're, they, they, they don't play out identically. They are importantly different. The role that symbolic capitalists, um, occupy in society changed immensely over the last century. The constitution of these fields has changed immensely. Uh, well, you know, there are a lot more women. There are a lot more non-white people, uh, in these professions than there were in the past. Um, and so on and so forth. So all of those, all of those factors you, you, you described, I think they actually do, they do, um, matter for, especially for understanding the ways in which this period of awakening might differ um, from previous episodes, but I don't think they explain why awakenings happen at all. So if woke recurs, do you think there's a ratchet effect where it comes back bigger and stronger each time, a bit like the destructiveness of war? Or is it more of a random walk, like the next wave of woke in 37 years, you know, might be half as strong as the one we just had? What's your model? Yeah, I think it's it's kind of a a random walk that that depends a little bit on. So what I argue in the book is that the um like so for instance look at the la uh, when we look at the last period of awakening in the late 80s and early 90s um it was much less um uh, that was the last time we had these struggles over political what they called political correctness then or PC culture which um which which we call wokeness today um but uh as I argue in the book, it didn't last as long that that awakening. It was shorter than most of the others, actually, um, shorter than the one in the '60s, shorter than the one after 2010. It was a little shorter, um, and it also wasn't as quite as dramatic. So I think there are these kind of uh, contextual factors uh, that kind of that that might um, that significantly inform uh, kind of how severe it is or how long it it lasts, um, how long it's able to sustain itself, or uh, you know how long it is until the the frustrated elites get enough of them get satisfied that they disengage. Um, so I think it's more of a, my guess is that it's more of a random walk, but I'm open to persuasion. Why does neuroticism seem to be higher on the political left? Yeah, I think, um, so I think there are a few, uh, so I wrote this article for American Affairs um, that's called something like how to understand the subjective well-being gap between liberals and conservatives or something like this. There is a lot of research um, for going back decades and across societies and cultures um, that seems to suggest that uh, a lot of forms of, of neuroticism and also um, things like depression and anxiety and other, other things like this um, do seem to be more pronounced among people who uh, self-identify with left ideology. The question um, is, is it something, um, is there some kind of same similar factors that kind of um, drive people towards, uh, that kind of predispose people towards 
um, neuroticism and also predispose them towards leftism? Or is there some way in which progressive ideology might feed into neuroticism, for instance, by, um, so in a lot of uh, social justice oriented spaces, uh, there's, there's research that white people um, who, inter who, when they engage with minorities, white progressives, when they engage with minorities, they shift a lot, they do things like competence downshifting, which is like when white, when white conservatives talk to minorities, they talk about them and you ask them, like, what do you, what's your job? What do you do? What do they, they answer those kinds of questions the same, whether they're talking to a black person or a white person. For, for progressives and liberals, um, if you, when they're talking to a white person, they'll give a more sophisticated answer about what it is they do and what, you know, but then when they're talking to a black person, even someone who's, who's, um, you know, even when you kind of control class markers and stuff, they, they downshift, they talk in simpler language and they kind of, um, uh, in a way that's kind of patronizing. Um, and, and you see this in a range of studies, uh, that white liberals tend to be more conscious of, um, of race and, and therefore change uh, in a more dramatic way how they engage with non-whites versus whites. And so this kind of rumination, like, oh, am I, am I possibly offending someone? Am I, am I saying the right thing? What is this person thinking of me? Do they think I'm racist? Do they think I'm a good ally? So there's, there is probably a sense in which um, sometimes people internalizing this uh, progressive, um, these progressive commitments and really wanting to be a good ally and wondering if they're a good ally and wondering if, the people that they're trying to ally with perceive them to be a good ally <laughs> and stuff like that can, um, can kind of, uh, feed into, um, kind of feed it. So, so it could be that the progressive ideology itself kind of exacerbates, um, uh, neuroticism. Um, or it could be that there's something about, um, if you're already neurotic, um, that could also like just make these kinds of ideologies more attractive to you <laughs> compared to ideologies where you wouldn't worry about what is this other person. So I don't, you know, I think the relationship there is uh, unclear. It's interesting. Is it a common driver's thing? Is it a, but one thing I will say um, that I do talk about a little bit in the book is that the symbolic professions um, in virtue of gatekeeping who becomes part of them by college degrees and, and, and as a result of other factors uh like the socioeconomic the kind of community symbolic capitalists tend to grow up in et cetera et cetera um it, it it is the case that the people who get folded into the symbolic professions are very um tend to think about the social world at all times even when we're not in periods of awakening they they, they tend to um have very idiosyncratic um kind of psychological profiles and modes of engagement in politics that are very different than most people. We tend to be more ideological in general. Uh, we tend to be more kind of extreme. <laughs> we're more likely to hold extreme political views. Um, in some ways, we're more do dogmatic, more conformist. We're very conscientious uh, on, the, on the positive side. Um, uh, we tend to um, be more cognitively sophisticated and, and so on. And so there are these kind of... Um, so the professions themselves select for this unusual kind of slice of society to begin with. Uh, and then um, how that relates to um, the, 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 the views we hold, I think is a really interesting question. Um, and I'm not, I'm not completely sold on an answer yet. <laughs> how would a great awakening look be different and be different in a Muslim society? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's interesting is when you, when you, I didn't get a chance to talk about this too much in the book, um, because, uh, you know, space, <laughs> you can't talk about everything. <laughs> but, but one, one thing that is interesting is that, uh, when you look at, uh, internationally, um, there do seem to have been a kind of parallel movements, uh, worldwide in a lot of symbolic capitalist spaces and in a lot of, um, uh, symbolic capitalists uh, among symbolic capitalists in a lot of international contexts. So for instance, the black lives matter movement had, if you go to symbolic, um, symbolic hubs around the world, including places like Seoul, South Korea, where there's not really a meaningful percentage of black people in South Korea. Um, but they had black lives matter protests and, um, and the same thing with, uh, Occupy Wall Street protests or me too, or the March for science. They played out in a lot of these, um, very, uh, heterogeneous international context, but mostly among, but in all cases, almost exclusively among symbolic capitalists and in 
symbolic economy hubs. Um, and so it seems like um, there are uh, there, there are this set of kind of um, commonalities in terms of our politics, in terms of our interests, in terms of our social position, other things like that, that um, do seem to uh, do seem to allow uh, that do seem to drive kind of similar things, have not identical. Okay, so how would things play out in a Muslim society specifically? Um, and how would it maybe be different from, um, so there, I think, you know, in one, in one way, and I suspect, and actually I don't need to suspect, it is just the case <laughs> that in a lot of, um, uh, Muslim societies, like say when you, if you look at Turkey and, um, uh, they had, they had a number of protests, uh, related to like the Erdogan government and some, um, perceived, uh, kind of oppressive or or kind of power grabbing moves by Erdogan and his coalition that were unrelated to the to the great awakening they were about like this guy is doing this thing right now and we think it's bad um but uh but it but it is the case when you look at some of the protest movements that have happened in places like Istanbul um that 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 are more connected to the kind of globalish uh protest movements that you that you see in America um even in those contexts, uh, things like um, pushing for feminism or or gay rights, um, while much riskier and more controversial uh, in a in a in a place like Istanbul um, than in you know uh, London, you do actually see some of those elements around gender and sexuality and stuff um, playing out in these movements. One thing that's different is the justification is sometimes less. Um, sometimes it's it's like purely, you know, pretty secular people who are participating in it as well. Um, because in, in a lot of societies and cultures, not just in the United States, um, uh, symbolic capitalists are often, uh, kind of less oriented towards especially traditional forms of religion. Um, but, uh, and actually this is one thing that I think is interesting. And I think this goes to the heart of what you were asking about in some ways. There is this interesting relationship um, between wokeness and kind of um, Protestantism. Of <laughs> you course, say? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Puritanism even. Yes. Um, it's an interesting historical relationship. And it's also, there's this kind of like really interesting uh, and profound, I, I think, um, relationship between the social gospel of, um, uh, you know, kind of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in, in the United States and 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 uh, uh, the UK and so on, and um, and and a lot of what we understand to be um, wokeness today. But put aside Istanbul, which is a kind of bridge city to the west. I went to Konya, Turkey. I visited the grave of Rumi. On paper, you could even argue Rumi is fairly woke as a poet, as a thinker. But I didn't feel much woke in Konya. I mean, what is it about Islam? that insulates it from woke or would you not agree with that conclusion? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, so again, I, I do think like uh, at least part of the story is that there is this relationship, um, historically, culturally, and so on between what you might call weird culture and, um, wokeness and also what you might, uh, think of as kind of, uh, and, and, and kind of Anglo-Saxon Protestantism and wokeness. I do think there is, there is kind of, um, this, interesting set of relationships um and they're actually kind of that's actually that's a really interesting thing to say <laughs> because like actually um so part of joe uh, uh joe henrik's argument in the weirdest people of the world uh, is that actually what sets what sets weird society what what kind of create um helped push for these kind of unique ways of thinking about society in the world was actually not Protestantism. It was the the Catholic Church's kind of marriage and family program um, that forbid things like cousin marriage and and uh, and had all of these um, other kind of uh, um, forbid polygyny and concubines and all this, and had all these kind of other downstream effects. And he shows that actually places that the Catholic Church um, had had kind of stronger and more pronounced um, rule over. Um, are actually more characteristically weird. Um, and so I think that that story that uh, um, Henrich tells 
sits at an interesting angle with what I just said about Protestantism, <laughs> but I think both are actually true. I'm just not sure how to exactly reconcile them. Okay. But, um, either way, uh, so, so th the point is, um, uh, most Islamic societies and, and actually uh, not just Islamic societies, but even, um, societies like China and so on, um, have, uh, a lot of, um, have importantly different, uh, kind of cultural historical heritages, uh, maybe not as different as I wrote a, I wrote a piece for, uh, for a sociology journal, uh, Socius, um, about, uh, social science during the Islamic Commonwealth period. Uh, and, um, one of the big arguments, um, that I make in that, uh, paper is that a lot of the ways that we understand a lot of the associations that people have today about Islamic culture and how it's different from the West and why it's different from the West. Um, a lot of these, these trends are actually, um, some of them have kind of deep longstanding historical roots, but some of them are actually more of more contemporary um, <laughs> vintage. Do you think that you being a Muslim makes you a more perceptive observer of the Great Awakening because you're coming at it quite from the outside in some way? Um. Well, I mean, I'm a convert to Islam, though. So I was I was raised in uh, I was raised in the United States um, by um, by non-Muslim parents uh, in a military town in a military community, and uh, and I came to uh, to Islam later. Uh, it might be that. There's some, um, I, although, you know, my wife is, uh, is, uh, Lebanese and, um, and so, and, and she grew up most of her life in Saudi Arabia and Lebanon and other places like that. Although she, she did spend a non-trivial share of her childhood in the States as well. But, but all to say, um, there might be some kind of a cultural disconnect from, from a lot of other, but I'll say, there's this tendency in the social sciences, especially in my field, <laughs> which I, uh, which I don't love where, um, you'll see social theorists make an argument about how it might be that some particular set of society might have unique insight over society compared to most other Americans. And it just tends to always be the specific slice of society that the theorist themselves belongs to. <laughs> and so it ends up being a story about like, why am I smarter than everyone else? Why can I see things that everyone else but can't I'm see? But I'm not a and, Muslim. You might see things I don't, right? No, no. Well, and so here's the thing is I think it's actually true. I think it's actually true that people of, um, with different kinds of life experiences and backgrounds and values and commitments, um, do perceive uh, and reason about the world in sometimes in non-trivially different ways. And this is why I've long been affiliated um, with an organization called Heterodox Academy that, that one, seeks to, to kind of research <laughs> on that point. And I've done some research on that point myself. Um, but then also uh, tries to encourage, you know, institutions to fold in a wider and engage with a, a wider range of, of thought and perspectives and stakeholders and stuff like this. I actually do think there's, there's truth to that broad point that you and I probably do perceive and reason about the world in different ways in no small part because we have very different life experiences, very different commitments, social ties, social networks, and all of that. That seems perfectly plausible to me. I just don't want to, um, I have, I just have an aversion to, uh, narratives that implicitly or not, uh, uh, or, or directly, um, seem to, that are, that again, that are common in, in my field, um, <laughs> that seem to, that, that argue that there's some subset of people who have like especially acute understandings of the social world rather than the point that I, that I made and that I, I think you also make, which is that we all have actually partially in situated knowledge and by kind of cramming our stuff together, <laughs> we get a really, um, we get a much more, uh, complete, comprehensive, um, nuanced understanding of the world. That seems true to me. I don't think it's true though that like, you know, Muslims or people who are, um, mixed race in the case of, uh, or, or other, like, depending on what these narratives are, <laughs> um, have some kind of like special insight. Am I correct in thinking of you as a black Muslim as opposed to merely a Muslim who is black? 
Yeah, I think that seems right. Uh, well, yeah, so there is this, um, you know, there is this kind of interesting indigenous uh, culture. It's, so one thing that's interesting, if you look at Islam in America, or you, or you look at a lot of, um, a lot of uh, mosques and, and kind of Muslim communities in America are kind of geared around the immigrants and the immigrant experience, because a lot, a huge share of the Muslim portion in the United States are first, second, um, sometimes third generation immigrants, but people um, who haven't, um, haven't been in the United States, you know, families that haven't been in the United States for as long as, you know, for, for generations and generations and so on. Um, but there is this kind of, um, an exception to that general pattern <laughs> is that there is a, uh, although Muslims have been in the United States since, uh, since the beginning, I mean, the, the founders were, were writing about Islam and Muslims. Um, in fact, using Muslims as a, <laughs> as kind of a limit case for tolerism, like we should be able to even tolerate those people. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, okay. Uh, but there is something interesting about, um, there's this kind of longer indigenous heritage, uh, more, more indigenous, more uniquely American, um, heritage of, uh, Islam in the, in the black community among American descendants of slaves, black community. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so I think that's interesting. Now, I come at this from a great distance, obviously white, not really religious. But my impression from a distance is that in the 1970s, uh, Nation of Islam being a black Muslim, it was a quite significant, significant movement. But since then, it's been dwindling. Is that wrong? Like, set me straight. Like, I know you know more about this than I do. I mean, I don't think it's, I think it's dwindling in the sense that some of the leaders associated with that movement, um, uh, like, have been discredited. So even Malcolm X himself, who was one of the key spokespeople for the, um, for the kind of politically oriented arm of, of, um, kind of, uh, black Muslim culture grew alienated from people like Louis Farrakhan over the course of his life and came to see people like Farrakhan as corrupt as preaching this kind of gospel, this kind of anti-white, um, anti-Semitic gospel that's out of step with Islam uh, as, 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 as he came to understand it when he went on, um, on, on Hajj and stuff. Um, he, he came back from, the Middle East with a completely different, more universalistic oriented approach to Islam um, and began to kind of go to war <laughs> with uh, Farrakhan and others. And, um, and then he was killed. Um, so I think, <laughs> so I think things like the assassination of Malcolm X and the gradual discrediting of people like um, Louis Farrakhan have, have made it such that um, like, there's not really a black Muslim, uh, political force, uh, in like a politically mobilized activist base of, uh, of kind of black Islam in the way that there was in the sixties and seventies. Um, but there are a lot of, but there can, but there do continue to be a lot of, um, black Muslims. It's just that they're not tied to this kind of weird political structure <laughs> that was the case in the, uh, in the, in the, as they were in the 60s and 70s. Say you were to try to explain to me some mix of either the, the theology of black Muslims or the appeal of being a black Muslim compared, say, to Sunni Islam. So take Islam for granted. What's the case you would make for it, trying to persuade someone or just illuminate what, what the appeal is? Well, I mean, most, most, most Muslims in, uh, most black Muslims in America are, are, are Sunni. Um, I guess one of the things that's different, um, it, it, I mean, the difference is just more, more cultural, right? Um, so again, for, for, for most other, um, kind of Muslim communities in America, they're just, um, they're, they're kind of, um, interesting mishmashes of, of, um, in fact, a lot of them are actually more specialized. So, uh, so there are a lot of mosques in America where most of the people who, who attend them are, are, for instance, um, Indonesian or where most of the people who attend them are from Pakistan or India, um, or where most of the, you know, and so there are, there is this kind of interesting ethnic sorting. It's not, um, and I, it's actually kind of unfortunate to my mind <laughs> and, uh, kind of at odds with the universalistic mes message of Islam, but you see the same thing in Christian churches in the United States too, right? You have black churches, you have, you have kind of, uh, you have white churches, you have churches with specific subsets of white people, <laughs> other churches with different, uh, you know, so it goes. It, well, and so I, I think actually if I'm revisiting the initial question, um, 
I would sort myself as a Muslim who happens to be black rather than a black Muslim. But uh, the reason I, I answered the question the way that I did in the first case is just because um, there's this, a deep sense in which I mean, I was I've, because I've been black my whole life, but I've been Muslim for for uh, for a much shorter period of time, uh, about fifteen years now, I think. Um, uh, so, you know, I've um, and so I guess of the of the two identities, um, one of them has a um, has a longer standing association, which is probably why I answered the question I did. But but now that I understand what you were what well, kind of what you were getting at a little bit better from the follow up questions, I guess I would understand myself more of a, a, as a Muslim who happens to be black in the sense that I actually um, I I think that um, there is this kind of long standing. While while I'm kind of more culturally aligned with like, you know, um, black Muslims in America, just because you know, again, we there's a there's a more, um, uh, a more common set of history and culture and all of this. Um, I do uh, I, I subscribe to a more kind of universalistic view of of what we should be striving to do as Muslims to engage with people across faith traditions, across ethnic traditions, and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, across ethnic lines and so on and so forth, rather than having a kind of parochial, inward-looking view at, you know, uh, at, at Black people as somehow distinct from everyone else. Your last name reflects that universalistic view, right? Yeah, Al-Garbi, yeah, yeah. Uh, of the West, the Westerner, yeah, yeah. And Musa is Moses. Musa is Moses, why, yes. Why Moses? Um, yeah, I, I'm, well, um, you know, he's actually, uh, there's a great book that just came out, uh, I think it's Mustafa Eichel who wrote it, uh, called, uh, The Muslim Moses. Um, uh, that's, um, yeah, about, you know, how, uh, across faith traditions, actually, like Moses is a figure of great importance across, um, uh, across all of, uh, across Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Um, as the central figure who helped, um, you know, uh, bring the law and, and, and kind of guide, uh, guide believers into the, you know, down the right path. And, um, yeah. And I think, um, it's funny. So, uh, so my name is Moses, my son, I named him Ezra, <laughs> um, because in a lot of, uh, you know, because uh, Moses was kind of the bringer of the law, Ezra was the restorer of the law, or whatever. So there's this kind of interesting. Uh, but um, yeah, so I do agree that there is this kind of universalistic orientation, even in the, even in my, even in my name. What is it about Catholicism that led you to grow disillusioned with it? Yeah, so there. Um, that's funny. This isn't a thing I've actually talked about yet. Um, but the the core. Um, the core problem that I ended up having is that based on my reading of the scriptures, I came to believe that Jesus was not God and did not understand himself to be God and wasn't arguing that he was God made flesh. Even some of the words he used to refer to himself, like this, he constantly referred to himself as the son of man. Well, in the Torah, Ezekiel is re re repeatedly referred to as son of man, not to indicate that he's God incarnate, but precisely to remind him that he is not, that he is the son of man. <laughs> and um, and uh, so Jesus adopting that term for himself, constantly referring to himself in that way, and so on. Um, anyway, so in, in this and in many other uh, ways, as I was reading the scriptures, I came to believe that Jesus uh, wasn't God. And, and in principle, that's not a way that doesn't rule out Christianity. In the early church, there were a lot of Christians who didn't believe that Jesus was God, who just viewed him as a prophet. Um, uh, but in Catholicism didn't go that route. And, you know, the philosopher Quine uh, had this theory of uh, this kind of... Um, way of talking about our beliefs. He described them as a web of these kind of inter interconnected beliefs where some of them are kind of more central and where we, if you kind of tear them out of the thing, it, it, they don't just go by themselves. <laughs> they pull a lot of other stuff with them. And in the case of, um, as a Catholic, if you reject the idea um, that Jesus is God, um, uh, that there, if you reject the idea of a trinity of, 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 of 
one God in three persons, um, then that changes a, a lot. It changes the meaning of sacraments like communion. Um, it changes the meaning of just so much. Um, and so there wasn't really a way to reconcile Catholicism um, with the beliefs I came to hold about um, Jesus and what his message was and what his intent was. And um, as I left Catholicism, um, as I became kind of alienated from Catholicism, I gradually came to be alienated from religion writ large and became <laughs> and became a, a uh, somewhat militant atheist for a little bit. But but that's what started me down the path, basically, as I I came to conclude from my study of the scriptures that Jesus probably didn't understand himself to be God, and that as a consequence, the the kind of religious tradition that I'd been part of that goes back you know millennia, <laughs> and um, and uh, and the the kind of rituals that we participated in that people have been doing around the world for all of this time. And but you could have just become a Jew, right? Or or some variant of that. So there's something about the idea of the Quran being a book that is holy on a very different level of all other books, you know, holier in kind than, say, the Bible. Well, I think, um, so, yeah, so as I was, so I was an atheist for a while, but then I had this problem where I kind of rationally convinced myself that religion was garbage <laughs> and, um, and uh, there was no God, but I couldn't make myself like feel it. Um, and so this left me in a dilemma where it's like, well, um, I could just say I'm spiritual, but not religious, or I could say, um, but that was kind of intellectually unsatisfying to me and spiritually unsatisfying. <laughs> or I could just deny these feelings that I had, but that's terrible because then you're like a bad faith atheist and that's really weird. So I started asking myself basically. Um, and so I started looking into other, um, faith traditions and, and I, uh, at some point in this journey, I, I started reading the Quran and I came to decide that it's a prophetic, uh, and I came to the conclusion that it was a, a prophetic work. And so I was like, well, if I think Muhammad is a prophet and I do believe in God, then maybe I'm a Muslim. And so I looked into it more and eventually, um, took the plunge, but I don't, uh, but I, but while I do think the Quran is um prophetic work, I actually don't think in a, and actually um the Quran itself is full like over and over and over again. It stresses this point actually um that uh the um the Torah uh well actually the the Talmud writ large um I mean sorry uh the Torah yeah the Torah the gospels um I actually do recognize those as um of equal footing with the, I, I don't, I don't view them as in any way being inferior to, um, to the Quran. I just, um, and, and in fact, um, I would say that my background in, um, in Catholicism, uh, in some ways enriched my understanding of, of, of the Quran. I mean, it's a very rich text for people who have familiarity with the, um, with the Bible, uh, which um, I, I think is actually kind of regrettable and unfortunate that um, more Muslims are less familiar with Judaism and Christianity um, than, to my mind, they they would be ideal. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I'm not a um, I'm not a Muslim supremacist in that way. <laughs> Putting aside Ibn Khaldun, who do you think is the great sociologist of Islam? Yeah. Um, so I, I, so, so that paper I mentioned, it's called People of the Book, uh, Social Science in the Islamic Commonwealth Period. And, um, and it focuses, that one focuses on, on four people, uh, Al Farabi, um, Ibn Khaldun, um, and, uh, Al Razi, and, um, someone else whose name, uh, is, not coming to me right now, but all to say, I actually think, uh, I like Al-Farabi's work a lot. Um, he, he, um, among other things, uh, one of the contributions I think is really, that's really important of his and is underappreciated, um, is he's one of the social scientists. Um, he's one of the people who, who he might've been the first person to really come forward with a, oh, Al-Biruni was the other one, which is wild for me to forget him because he's actually really important, but Al-Farabi, um, actually is important because he advanced what I think is one of the first um, robust social construction theories of religion. Um, and so he tells this uh, really kind of um, rich story to explain why it is that 
religions have so much commonality, but also like why they're importantly different. And the story he tells, like he's pretty militant in his work or pretty committed in his work to not basing it on scripture, um, uh, to, to kind of go from, um, to make arguments from reason and from kind of looking at the, uh, you know, making observations of the world around him. Um, but the the story he ends up telling, the kind of social construction narrative he ends up telling about religion is actually very robustly, you know, reinforced in the Quran itself, um, which is another thing that I think a lot of Muslims don't fully appreciate, <laughs> is that um, the argument um, that, like, Al-Farabi's argument is that religions are, are kind of, um, they're divinely inspired, but socially constructed. And they're not, um, and, and they're kind of, um, have this origin and, in, in kind of deep universal truths, but they also are products of particular times and places, um, that importantly shape how people understand and pursue, um, and, and kind of relate to those truths, um, in ways that can be, um, in some cases, even distorting and limiting, and he didn't exclude his own society and culture or his own religious faith tradition from from that uh, from this point as he was making it. Um, yeah, so Al Farabi, I think, is important. Al Biruni is actually really great. Um, so he he pioneered um, a lot of what we would call today anthropology, doing these deep um, ethnographic oriented studies of a lot of different societies and cultures, um, pioneering a lot of empirical methods that we use to, um, that we use to study society today. Um, and, uh, also like really important for integrating math into, uh, <laughs> for integrating mathematics into social science, because prior to Albert, like in, in Greco Roman culture and even before, the, and even and in a lot of other contexts, like math, other than like traders, you know, uh, math wasn't used for like practical purposes um, so much. And in fact, um, a lot of people poo pooed the idea of using, uh, of trying to, and and so um, Baruni was actually really important in part. Like a lot of his his work on like comparing chronologies across time, I mean across cultures and across geographic locations and things like this, was really pioneering and in integrating mathematics into the social sciences in a way that wasn't commonly done before. And so he's, he's also really important. What do you think of the claim? You find this amongst people such as Olivier Roy, that extreme political Islam today is not a throwback to something fundamentalist, but that it's a quite modern product requiring modern technology. And it's this strange creation of the contemporary world as we know it. Yeah, I think he's absolutely right about that. that, that, that I, I alluded to that, I guess, um, briefly earlier in the conversation where I said a lot of the um, narratives and assumptions people uh, make when they when they perceive the differences between like Islam and the West today are actually um of of much more recent historical vintage than a lot of people um uh might might assume or take for granted um and in fact uh, prior to uh prior to that period there was a lot of like rich interplay between there were tensions between um uh, Muslim and Christian societies you know going back centuries um but there was also a lot of rich very rich um cultural transmission interplay um and and so on and so forth as well um and uh yeah so i mean there were there were these kinds of shifts um starting in the uh late 19th earliest early 20th century especially um to things like the kind of um uh, to the broad global economic order and uh, seeing the development of uh, capitalism, seeing, uh, you know, kind of colonial expansion of, um, and also the discovery of things like um, oil, like transformed, like when you think about Saudi Arabia, uh, like Wahhabism was, was a kind of, was a, an offshoot that was prominent among, uh, a, you know, a, a small sect of a very poor society um, and, and a poor, pretty remote society in Saudi Arabia and the discovery of things like oil and the transformation of Saudi Arabia from a rural poor place into a rich petro state um, that's tied to this kind of a stour Salafist understanding of religion. Um, 
was a very geopolitically consequential um, development and completely transformed in a in a very profound ways that are not fully appreciated. I think in a lot of these conversations, um, kind of the nature of the kind of polit- geopolitical orientation of Islam uh, in the world. If we think about European, I would call it disillusionment with the assimilation of their Muslim immigrants, <clears throat> is your view that they exaggerate the problem or that there's some fundamental difference between the Muslim and Christian perspectives that just won't be overcome? Or what? what is your take on that? I mean, I think that there is, um, I think there are, you know, no matter what kind of, uh, no matter where the migrants are coming from, if you have large numbers of people that are um, entering a, a a different society and culture, especially if they're clustering in particular places and kind of forming um, ethnic enclaves and stuff, there will be tensions between the longstanding population and the new arrivals. I and mean, we're seeing this right now in Springfield and Haiti uh, being fanned on by the current uh, Republican um, presidential uh, nominees. But even before J.D. Vance and Donald Trump started talking about this um, and making it a national issue. There were tensions within Springfield between the Haitians and the and the, and the longstanding and people in Haiti are not Muslim, um, but that's the um, uh, that's you know that's a thing that you would expect. But don't we know the second generation of Haitians more or less assimilate into being American blacks? Whether one thinks that's good or not, there's a lot of evidence that happens. The next generation of Muslims say Algerians in France. I mean, what, what should we think will happen there? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's, it's, it's generally the case that a lot of um, times, um, and, and I think this is true across ethnic and religious lines, is that a lot of times um, second, third generation uh, uh, people do integrate um, a lot more with the mainstream culture, in part because um, they have strong uh kind of um incentives to do that like if they want a wider friend network if they want to succeed in the professional sphere the schools that they're going to the 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 uh, and so on and so forth all of the there are all sorts of pressures and incentives that incline people to um and on top of that you know frankly uh it's often the case that you know people come to these uh to different countries for a reason because there is also often something that was um very unsatisfying uh, about the the milieu that they were living in that was unsustainable or intolerable, and so they come to other countries in search of a different life and and this is also a thing that helps push people towards actually pursuing um that different life rather than trying to simply reproduce um you know uh Sudan and France that said there are other there there are elements of their own society and culture um that people do uh, from of the society and culture they came from that they think are actually good and worth preserving or that they think are like, I actually think this is a better way of doing things. Why don't we do it this way here? Why do we, you know? Um, and again, these are negotiations that, that happen, you know, um, kind of across the board when you have large numbers of, of migrants. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of these, these um, tensions will persist so long as there are continued waves of migration. Um, but we'll ultimately, I'm optimistic <laughs> that there will be some, some equilibrium. They'll work themselves out. Um, I think the, um, the kind of, I think one, one source of tension in, in, um, in France, I think in particular is that France has a, and this is why I think, um, integ- um, it's sometimes easier for immigrants to, integrate in countries like America, frankly, is France does have this really aggressive, hostile um, kind of approach to secularism, uh, a really militant approach to secularism, where, for instance, in some schools, they try to push pork on kids. Um, they, they kind of eliminate non-pork options. They say, you know, uh, your, your kid is either going to eat the, the same things as other French kids or they're going to go hungry. That's the choice they have. Or they kind of outlaw Things like um, head coverings, even though nuns, uh, people from Eastern Europe, a lot of people wear head cov- coverings other than Muslims. But in order to prevent Muslims from following their own cultural traditions, they make it so that no one can wear head coverings. Actually, they have partial exemptions for nuns, which is interesting. And things like no one can wear uh, crosses or other forms of religious um, uh, ornaments in a prominent way. So this kind of militant, rather than kind of America's more pluralistic approach. Um, uh, 
you know, France has this really militant confrontational approach to dealing with religious minorities that I think drives a lot of the tensions in France on this because they, they do have this really hostile approach towards religion in general, especially, you know, public oriented religion and religious minorities, um, that I think is unfortunate. Um, and so I think some of the problems that you see in France are a product of France, but I think in other, in other cultural contexts where there's less of that, um, kind of militant government oriented hostility towards religion. Um, a lot of these things are easier to resolve. What's your favorite novel? My favorite novel, huh? You know, um, that's an interesting question. It's been a minute. I mean, uh, the brothers by Dostoevsky, uh, I really love, I, when I started writing this book and actually really starting when I, when I started, uh, probably when I started my, my PhD program, I used to read a lot of, um, fiction. Um, and it's, it had been a while. Uh, I realized as I was writing my book that it had been probably a decade since I had read something that was like purposely fiction. <laughs> I read a lot of, <laughs> and, um, and so I started, and so I picked up some books by, um, I had, um, a couple of books by Umberto Eco that I had wanted to read for a long time, uh, Foucault's Pendulum, The Name of the Rose. Um, and so I, I dove into those. I really enjoyed them. And so I'm trying to get back into reading uh, fiction now, but it's, um, it had been a long time, <laughs> I realized. Uh, What's your favorite movie? My favorite movie? Uh, I like a lot of the Charlie Kaufman movies. Um, like um, he has this one, uh, Synecdoche, New York, that I think is really... Uh, fascinating and and um a lot of fun uh i like charlie kaufman charlie kaufman's movies pretty consistently woody allen a lot of his movies are great um he's you know he's been on a big journey in terms of his filmmaking over the years from this kind of slapstick funny stuff to these kinds of things but i think it's all really interesting and, and good i love woody allen's movies um yeah last question fiction aside what do you want to learn about next yeah um in the short term, um, I have a, a second book project, uh, a kind of follow up to this one. So this book was kind of focused a lot on, um, knowledge economy professionals on the kind of winners in the knowledge economy on institutions of knowledge production and so on and so forth. Um, and the initial plan for this book, when I pitched it <laughs> to Princeton <laughs> was that I was going to do like, uh, part of the book focused on, on us, on symbolic capitalists, the knowledge economy professionals. And then towards the latter end of the book, I was going to kind of turn the analytic lens from the winners in the knowledge economy to people who perceive themselves to be the losers, people who are more sociologically distant from us, who work, who provide physical goods and services to people, who um, live in smaller towns, more rural areas, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, it proved untenable to do that in the space of one book, in fact, even this book, even when we split it into two books, <laughs> it was, um, and it still took a little bit of, uh, um, cutting and polishing to get it into, uh, the state it's in today. Um, and so the second book, what I'll be thinking about for the next, for the next, uh, couple of years, um, are, are going to be people who are more, more sociologically distant from knowledge economy professionals and trying to look at the struggle between us and them and to understand it in a, in a deeper way. I mean, I've done some provisional work and I do have a lot of, um, you know, pretty tight content, um, for the second book. And I'll be sh shopping it out to publishers after we see how well this one does or not. But, um, but I'm going to be doing, of course, a lot of research and thinking about, um, about these tensions in the, in the near future. And that'll be kind of occupying my brain space, I think. Again, I'm a fan of Musa's new book, We Have Never Been Woke, The Cultural Contradictions of a New Elite. Musa Algarbi, thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me. It was a real fun conversation.